happening tonight in Vancouver. It's the greatest moment in, in Canadian soccer history. Crowned champions, Christine Sinclair and Team Canada capture gold at the Olympics and the heart of a nation. The adage of, you know, if she can do it, so can I, that's what they can believe now. If not now, then when? A question many are asking about a Canadian women's professional soccer league. If the team's gold medal win will spark any change. This is a quite a quite a challenging time for government and for the union, but the union isn't a strong bargaining position. Canada's border service agents start work to rule as they seek a new contract from Ottawa. This is City News Everywhere. There are 464 new cases and no new deaths from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours here in BC. But certain parts of the province are now going back under restrictions. And some of those restrictions go into effect as of today. The Central Okanagan has been dealing with an outbreak with most of those in hospital unvaccinated. Though Dr. Bonnie Henry says some of these patients received a first dose. She says many of those infected in the Central Okanagan are between the ages of 20 and 40. As you know, we have been watching this outbreak very carefully. And despite the measures that were announced a week ago on July 28th, we're still seeing cases growing, mostly among unvaccinated people or those who've only received a single dose of vaccine. And unfortunately, we're now seeing spillover into our health care settings, especially long-term care. We have two outbreaks in the central Okanagan and two additional outbreaks in long-term care. And it's affecting the lives of the residents and staff in those facilities. And also now we're seeing dozens of staff members um, in acute care settings who've been infected. And that puts stress on our health care system across both the central Okanagan, but all of the interiors. In the central Okanagan, outdoor and indoor organized gatherings will be capped at 50 people and bars and clubs will be closed. Restaurants and casinos will be able to stay open with some limitations and there will also be restrictions around vacation rentals. Dr. Henry is asking anyone with travel plans to the central Okanagan in the next few days to strongly reconsider. It's the end of an era for the Vancouver Convention Center. This is where hundreds of thousands of people have received their COVID-19 vaccine doses since late March. And by the end of this month, that mass vaccination clinic will be shutting down. Vancouver Coastal Health says now that most people are fully immunized, it's scaling down its 12 mass vaccination clinics to just three over the course of August. That will free up resources to support targeted outreach efforts in communities where not as many people are vaccinated. It's been a dramatic and dangerous 24 hours for people living near the White Rock Lake fire in the southern interior. BC's Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth says everything is being done when it comes to providing firefighting resources. But he is disappointed in those choosing to disregard evacuation orders. Farnworth says some of the crews working on this fire, which is now a priority, have been put at risk because of those who refuse to leave their homes. Staying behind in an evacuated area not only risks your own life and the lives of your family, but it also risks the lives of the responders tasked with fighting the fire. No property is worth risking lives. Last night, firefighters with the BC Wildfire Service once again put their lives on the line to help evacuate people who chose to ignore evacuation orders. A small group of people found themselves being overrun by the rapid advance of this fire. While our crews were able to get the residents to safety, these brave firefighters very nearly paid with their lives. Minister Farnworth says he does have the power to issue fines of up to $10,000 for those who chose not to listen to evacuation orders, but he'd preferred not to go that route. The fire is a little more than 30 kilometers west of Vernon and has burned more than 45,000 hectares. It's classified as out of control. There has been wind throughout the day and it's in the forecast for tonight. Since April, there have been more than 1,400 fires across the province. More than 300 are active right now. 
While people are now being strongly urged against travel to or from the central Okanagan, Michael J. Ballingall with the Thompson Okanagan Tourism Association says hotels are already getting calls to cancel their trips and wedding venues are having to ask their brides and grooms to reduce their guest lists. Ballingall says as far so far people just don't seem to be getting the message when it comes to the restrictions. And so what people need to know uh, before they come is, first of all, masks are now mandatory. And, and this has been a, a bit of a problem over the last week. In, in my business up at Big White Ski Resort, we have the BC Downhill Mountain Bike Championships. We gave out over 400 masks today. And, and that's just meaning that people aren't prepared. I'm Adrian Gobriel. Thousands of Canadians were taken on a roller coaster ride today, and they didn't even have to leave their couch. Canada, our women's soccer team, striking gold at the Tokyo Olympics, and it has been a journey for fans and players, including Christine Sinclair. They were robbed of a chance at a gold medal in London 2012, but not today. Crowned Olympic champions. It's the greatest moment in, in Canadian soccer history. This marks the third straight podium for the Canadian women's soccer team at an Olympic Games. But this was the first time ever at the top. Like so many, soccer insider James Sharman was watching on, unsure if this would be Canada's day. There were ominous signs. And, you know, I think at halftime, most people thought, well, you know, silver's still great. You know, what a, what a great moment that still is for this team. But then the second half kicked off. Some really impressive subs from Bev Priestman. And you saw this team grow into the game and get their swagger back. And of course, Jesse Fleming from the spot, taking the ball from Christine Sinclair for the second game in a row. Incredible. It wasn't just Canadians cheering on this team. Arguably America's greatest ever soccer player, Abby Wambach, posting this video post-game, tipping her cap to Christine Sinclair and many others. Sinky. Nobody deserves it more than you, sister. Awesome. Congratulations to all of Canada, all of the players, also all the players who built the program, the Charmaine Hoopers, the Tancredis, the Sophie Schmidt. You guys are all a part of this win. I feel super emotional for you. Good job. Sinclair, now 38 years old, was pulled out of the game just before the end of regulation time. But anyone who's watched her over the years knows she's worthy of being in the conversation as one of the all-time greatest athletes in Canadian sports history. She is one of the top footballers the world has ever seen, right? That, that's footballers, soccer players. So, so why can't we then take that over to where does she stand in in Canada as a great athlete. And to me, she's right up there. When it comes to role models, this entire team is stacked. And according to the leaders of multiple soccer associations, these women will spark the next generation of talent. This is massive. Um, like when you look at where these girls are from, they're from all these little small towns all across Canada. So imagine a little girl that's five or six years old that sees, you know, one is from Caledon. Imagine. You're a normal person that grew up in Caledon and you're competing on the world stage. So the, the adage of, you know, if she can do it, so can I, that's what they can believe now. One of the young stars on Canada's team is Quinn, who's now the first transgender non-binary athlete to ever win an Olympic gold medal. Quinn used to play at North Toronto Soccer. We spoke with the president of the club late today. I hope that it will inspire many other athletes from the LGBTQ to S plus community to come and join the sport and um, feel more included because they, they are underrepresented. We want to be inclusive of as many people as possible. As the team and country savor this victory, some are wondering what's next, especially for team captain Christine Sinclair. Will she retire a captain? We'll have to wait and see. The next Women's World Cup is scheduled for next year. I'm Adrian Gobriel for City News. Vancouver's own Julia Grosso scored the winning penalty kick. We chatted with her very proud father and sister. They were up very early this morning watching the gold medal game from the family's home in Coquitlam. My house just exploded. 
a little bit nerve wracking before the, the kick, uh, the shot was taken, but after it went in, it's ecstatic. Were you surprised at all to see her uh, pull that off? Uh, no, no. Confident. I'm very confident, Dad. I knew we were going to win gold. I feel like the game in general was a bit stressful. And then obviously when they went to the PKs, I feel like we we're all anticipating her to like eventually shoot. And then when Seth Labe like saved that goal or whatever, like the next time we were like, okay, she's definitely coming on. And it happened so fast. And like once she scored, our whole family was going crazy. But I think it's a really important moment for her and her career. And we're really proud of her. Burnaby soccer star Christine Sinclair is being honoured by the city after Team Canada's gold medal win in Tokyo today. A massive medal has been draped over the building that bears her name in Burnaby. Mayor Mike Hurley says she's had an incredible career. We're so pleased that she was able to bring home the gold after all she's given. 21 years of soccer for Team Canada. It's an amazing record and uh, she has certainly led Canada through many battles. The building was renamed in honour of Christine Sinclair back in April and was formerly known as the 40th Centre. This is a quite, a quite a challenging time for government and for the union, but the union isn't a, it isn't a, a strong bargaining position. I think the government wants to open those borders. Working without a contract for over three years, Canada's border service agents have had enough and have started job action. As of Friday morning, CBSA uniform and non-uniform officers are on a work-to-rule campaign, doing only the minimum amount of work required. Most people think of border service officers as the uniformed officers they see when they cross the land border at an airport or a seaport. Uh, and that for sure the bulk of the officers but then you have more specialized officers who uh, are conducting intelligence work the same in uh, their intelligence service that their focus is on uh, border security and migration integrity uh, then you also have uh, the units that are looking for individuals who have come into Canada uh, or are in Canada contrary to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Kelly Sunberg worked a decade and a half with the CBSA and says it's more than just the uniform border officers working to rule. He says that with Canada easing COVID border restrictions with the U.S. on Monday, the union may have time on its side. The Public Service Union of Canada and Customs Immigration Union represent around 8,500 CBSA employees. Sundberg says border officers do just as much work as other law enforcement, but aren't compensated the same way. They are quite low compared to other law enforcement agencies, um, but also their pension, the, how their pension's calculated and when they, can, when they can actually go on pension. Treasury Board President Jean-Yves Duclos tweeting that negotiations went on all night, but the government has no intention of walking away from the table. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. That job action could impact operations at Vancouver International Airport as YVR gets ready to welcome back U.S. travelers. As of 9.01 p.m. on Sunday, fully vaccinated Americans can fly into Canada for non-essential travel. It's expecting a high number of passengers once the restrictions lift and you might be in for a longer wait than usual. Staff at YVR are ready to accommodate the demand, but updates could come if the work to rule action continues. A pedestrian is dead after an early morning crash with a garbage truck in Surrey. Police were called to King George Boulevard near 106th Avenue just before 3 o'clock. The driver stayed at the scene and has talked with investigators. Police are looking for dash cam footage and would like to speak with anyone who was in the area at the time. Police in Vancouver say a man is dead after an altercation in Grandview Park. It happened at around 1.30 yesterday afternoon. The 60-year-old Vancouver resident was assaulted by another person and he ended up unconscious. He was taken to hospital but later died of his injuries. Investigators believe that there were a number of people either walking or driving in that area as it was in the afternoon and these people may have seen what happened. However, this was an assault between two people, so the severity of the assault probably appeared minor to the to the odd passerby. Um, we need anyone with information to come forward. A 39-year-old has been arrested in connection to this case, and investigators believe this was an isolated incident. It's not clear how the two knew each other. Anyone with information should call Vancouver police. 
An impaired driver is being blamed for an incident that damaged several vehicles in Vancouver last night. It happened at around 10 o'clock near Quebec and National, not far from Science World. Witnesses say police chased someone in a vehicle who eventually crashed the car and tried to run. So we're up on the balcony on the 15th floor. This white car that's right here, it's crashed into the second one. Coming across the intersection, the cop car is waiting in the Science World parking lot, pulls out with more force than I've ever seen. A, a crash happened, smashes into the side of him, sends him parapeting back into this one, and then they sent the dogs in. Anyone who saw what happened last night is asked to get in touch with police. Canadians watched with pride as the softball team would clinch its first ever Olympic medal. For BC's own Danielle Laurie Locke and her teammates, the tournament will forever be remembered for its ups and its downs, but mainly their resilience. Oh, and that beautiful new piece of hardware. Japan would eventually go on to win gold. I've, I am absolutely fascinated with athletes who can just shake it off. I mean, I have a bad update, and three hours later, I can start speaking again. But yeah. you guys... Um, have a result that you don't want and you bounce right back and you clearly did. How do you do it? What do you all say to each other in that room? Honestly, that was probably the hardest loss that I've ever been a part of in my life. Like thinking of all the losses and there's been a lot of them. Like that one tore my heart out. The one thing that we had to do as a team is like we had to feel every emotion of that because you can't cover that up. You can't be like, oh yeah, okay, move, move on next game because our training over the course of the last four years has been eyes on winning an Olympic gold medal. Like it has. So when you know that that's not even an opportunity anymore and you lose it and it's that close, like it was just giving ourselves that five to six hour window to feel however you want to feel about it. You want to feel sad and you want to cry. That's totally okay. For me, hearing her say like, you know, you can't win gold, but you still have an opportunity to win an Olympic medal. Like I was like, damn straight, boo. Like I am not getting off a plane unless I have a medal around my neck. Like I cannot do that. Number one for our country with how, how well prepared we were, but number two for my little kids and knowing how much I've had to, to choose to be away from them 70 plus days. Like I need some hardware. For Mexico and your mindset when you were, when you guys were tied up, like yeah. what is going through your mind? There was a couple of times in the, in the seventh inning, that last inning where like I felt my hand shaking and I had to like remember like my sports psych stuff with Ken Revisa who passed away a couple of years ago. But I just had to remember like, dude, work your process, take a deep breath. Like the game doesn't change because there's, you know, one, there's a one run game. Like your job is to focus on every single pitch. If I'm looking at or thinking about too many things, I'm not in control of what I can do. And you feel it. You're like, damn, we're like two outs away from winning. Like, so you kind of get those shaky nerves. Um, but it was a good nerves, a good adrenaline to kind of, I think, add another mile, mile per hour or two. But it was by far the most nervous that I've ever been. It reminded me of the national championship game in 2009 with the Huskies, that same thing, 3-2 game, last inning. Like, you're juiced, you're proud. Um, and you just feel that moment. And if you could bottle up the emotions of it, like that's why high level athletes play those feelings you internalize and you love that. Um, and then when we won after, I mean, you just, it's almost like the world stood still for like five minutes of just like complete, like knowing everyone in your life is so happy for you knowing that like everyone is healthy and everyone that you love is okay. And you're just invested and you're loving it and you're, it was just a really proud moment that um, I'll remember forever. What's next for Danielle? She says she is thrilled with her entire softball career and is ready to move on to the next chapter. For City News, I'm Sportsnet 650's Caroline Frolic. This week in science, we're about enjoying the fresh air and contemplating how the Earth got its oxygen. Now, it's one of the great mysteries of Earth's science and a possible clue may have just been found at the bottom of Lake Huron. There's a lot going on with this one, so strap in. Obviously, the Earth was a very different place 2.4 billion years ago. There was almost no biodiversity since there was almost no oxygen in the atmosphere. Then came cyanobacteria, some of the very first life to show up on Earth. Like plants, these microbes draw energy from the sun through photosynthesis, and a byproduct of that is oxygen. So they're thought to be the drivers of what scientists call the Great Oxidation Event. But we don't really know how or why that process started. One idea, though, is that it's tied to the Earth's rotation. 
This planet was spinning around way faster than when it was young, so a day only took about six hours. As time went on, the rotation very gradually slowed, leading to the 24-hour days we have now. And some researchers in Michigan wanted to see what impact those longer days had on the cyanobacteria's ability to make oxygen. They went out to Middle Island Sinkhole in Lake Huron, where you can still find the smelly, gelatinous carpets of bacteria which dominated the planet billions of years ago. And by studying that goo, they found the more continuous sunlight the microbes got, the more oxygen they were able to produce. Now, the oxidation of the Earth happened both gradually and in two big steps. So the suggestion is the length of a day hit two specific thresholds that kicked the microbes into high gear. In any case, this is the first evidence linking the length of a day to where all this oxygen came from. With this week in science on City News, I'm News 1130's Curtis Doring. Vancouver's news is always available on the radio with News 1130 or online anytime at citynews1130.com. Your next edition of City News is tonight at 11. Thank you for watching and have a great night.